This is our Libertarian Crusader show, episode number 38. And today we have the great, I would say, Virginian hero, uh, Joe Salatin on here with us. And I've been on the Lunatic Tour. And, and so it, it's, it was a great experience being on there because I was not able, I was only able, also able to see the stuff that you've grown and the practices, but then also got to see uh, a, a human being that you've grown too, because it was her son who was uh, giving the tour. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I do I do most of them still, but if I happen to be out of town, then uh, then he's the he's the stand-in and does a great job. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I guess the, the first question I was wanted to, to ask. I mean, it's, there's there's so many. I mean, going through your books and all going through the battles you've had to undertake against uh, uh, FDA and agriculture and government in general. Um, how did you get started altogether then in this uh, lunatic business of farming? Yeah, well, um, I, I come from lunatic stock. My, my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine when it came out in, what, 1947, 48, right there post-World War II. And, uh, and so he always had a compost pile and, and uh, was quite an inventor, actually. He invented the very first uh, walking garden sprinkler, you know, the kind that rolls up the garden hose as it, as it walks through the garden. Hmm. And, um, and so he was quite a bit of a tinkerer. Dad got his bent from, from him. And, and so I got, you know, I got that from dad. So I don't, I don't have a conversion experience in this, in this space. Uh, I just grew up on, you know, on, uh, on the free man, mother earth news. And, um, and, you know, it was interesting. We were, if you know, my moniker, it's, you know, Christian libertarian environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic, uh, farmer. And, um, and it was quite an anomaly growing up. You know, we were, we were socially and religiously very conservative, but our farming friends were all, you know, hippies from the, you know, the, the Woodstock beaded beard and braless, uh, revolution. And, um, so, you know, I, I grew up with this, with this eclectic, uh, uh, you know, background, um, with, with the, the conservative. And then there were, you know, plenty of, uh, mar marijuana, uh, smokers in our house, but those were our farm friends, you know? Uh, and so we talked about composting and then, you know, went to church on Sunday and, you know, um, uh, met with folks who didn't have a clue, uh, <laughs> <laughs> about, about this this uh, clandestine uh, you know farm activity we were doing, they were still eating TV dinners and and uh, drinking coke. So uh, so yeah, it's a it's a very eclectic blend. And we realized very early on that if we were going to make a living as a small farm, we had to direct market. And um, uh, you know the government the government doesn't mess with you very much as long as you just kind of follow the rules and and continue being a, a colonial surf uh producing something for you know for the big outfits but if you start um you know uh, uh direct marketing value adding processing uh and, and trying to get a little capture a little more of that retail dollar um then that's when <laughs> that's when you kind of run run amok Right. Your competitors of big, uh, I guess, factory farming uh, don't kind of like that uh, entry into their cut of the market, for sure. And they line the pockets of a lot of these politicians and these a lot of uh, government agencies. Yeah, that's well, that's, that's right. You know, if you I've been to, to Richmond numerous times to do, you know, on public hearings and things. And it's almost obscene uh, when I'm a member of there's a Virginia Independent Consumers and Farmers Association. Um, that, that I helped found, oh goodness, uh, 15 years ago, I guess. And we've been able to, you know, keep government encroachment out of several things, uh, including raw milk herd shares and things like that. And we've gotten some offensive things passed, like the pickle bill, which allows anybody to do uh, $3,000 worth of pickles a year in your own house without any inspector there. Um, but anyway, when, when, when I go to Richmond on these, and you go to these hearings, it's, it's obscene how the, the, the head table up there that has the elected officials, you know, there's the, there's the, uh, member of the, you know, Farm Bureau Federation, the Poultry Federation, the, you know, name the, 
the conventional Orthodox trade group, they're sitting at the head table with the politicians. And, and we peasants, you know, we're back in the gallery. Um, you know, they say it's a hearing and we're participating, but it, but it's very clear that there's, there's a, that somebody's foot is on the scale, you know, and, and that foot on the scale is the Orthodox uh, trade associations and the large corporate interests that literally cozy up, I mean, shoulder to shoulder at the head table with the elected officials while the rest of us, you know, uh, uh, try to get a, a two minute, you know, a, a little two minute uh, slot in, in the hearing. It, it's quite, it's quite obscene actually. And, um, and it, 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 you know, pe- people who've never done it and never been there and seen it, it's hard for them to, to appreciate just how, uh, just how, um, well, only thing I can think of is how obscene it is. They just can't appreciate it. I think it's funny because they keep preaching this diversity thing lately. But what you were just mentioning is, you know, growing up in the farm world, you see a huge amount of diversity. I'm personally from Nebraska, so industrial ag center. And, uh, sure. you know, if you don't have a quarter million dollar piece of equipment or something like that, there's no way to break into that sort of industry unless you do something very creative like yourself. But every time you get creative, it seems like that's when the hammer comes down on you. And you've experienced that a lot, and but you've harnessed it and then turned it into positive energy. And I think that's, uh, you know, you and Cal are both two of my heroes and the reason I ended up here in Virginia. Right now, I happen to be in Norfolk closing down stores, but uh, no, it's an honor to talk to you. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's a delight. It's a delight to be here. Yeah. You know, uh, people don't realize that the, the bureaucracy is, as we know it and the, the, well, we call the, the political machine, the political machine uh, is there to, to ensure the longevity and, and uh, viability of the status quo. It's not there for innovation. Um, Innovation never comes from the government because the government has to please fifty-one uh, percent of the people, and so so by definition, government is inherently uh, I- inherently incentivized to protect what is, not create what isn't, and that's why everything that everything that the innovation in a society, what isn't the innovation always comes from a lunatic fringe, which is demonized and marginalized and criminalized by the, uh, you know, by the powers that be. It, it's not a conspiracy. I, I don't use the word conspiracy because use the word conspiracy, then, you know, you're a nutcase and nobody believes you. But but I call it a fraternity. It's a fraternity of ideas. It's a, it's a very close knit fraternity. And, uh, and, and if you, if you join that fraternity, you play by their rules, you know, there's a lot of, uh, power position and pros uh, and profits in that, in that fraternity. But if you dare to, uh, you know, take the road less taken as Robert Frost said, or walk to the beat of a different drummer, uh, then suddenly the whole system is, is a buzz like a, like a disturbed beehive. You know, what, what's this intruder, you know, <laughs> who dares to, to question our space? You know, that, that, that's the deal. Yeah. The, uh, you know, Schopenhauer quote, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. And I think, I think the, uh, organic farming community. And I mean, it's like, it's like everywhere these days, I, I feel like. So, you know, I think the truth is it's entering into maybe the third the third phase there, I would hope. But, uh, what, you know, I'm interested in the, in the way that you, 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 you're a conservative and you were, you know, you were like in this conservative crowd, but in the organic, um, space really early. And I go to, I went over to Sneed's nursery here in Richmond, uh, in North Chesterfield and picked up some seedlings for the first time and, and was, uh, looking for, you know, growing some stuff in our, in our yard this year. And, um, I, I couldn't help but notice, like, I was like, yeah, I bet you a lot of the folks here are pretty liberal, you know, and I don't know why I don't see more conservatives in a space like that thinking, 
this is the way you can be more self-reliant and this is the way you can be more, um, independent. You know, what, what, what do you, what do you see when you, uh, interact with different folks like that? Oh, what a great, uh, <laughs> let's, let's unpack this a little bit. I think for sure the environmental movement as we know it, uh, grew out of a very liberal, uh, mindset. Um, you know, I mean, good, going clear back to uh, Teddy Roosevelt with the Food Safety Inspection Service. And um, a lot of people don't realize that the, the, the love affair with government solutions, the love affair with government solutions um, grows out of a frustration with, uh, uh, with, with capitalism's um, exploitation of of the commons of uh, indiv- uh, of uh, personal whatever personal affirmation i mean henry ford henry ford is quoted to have uh, to have said when he took uh, foreign visitors through the ford plant he said the only thing i hate about this plant is that i have to hire a whole man when all i need are his hands that's an incredibly dehumanizing, exploitive approach. Uh, and so much of, you know, much of the, you know, the, the socialistic um, bent, it, you know, grows out of that. Uh, and, and people who read what I write, they, they know that uh, I don't think there should be a law about how much, you know, CEOs can earn as opposed to the lowest people in their firm. But I think if CEOs were smart, they would take a, a, an 80% pay cut and distribute that among their workers. And guess what? Uh, they'd probably have more loyal workers and a, a better functioning team. And, and so I like to promote this by the power of, of, of moral and conscience um, as opposed to by government uh, edict. So when I when I when I began you know uh, traveling and speaking a lot, it was amazing how many times. Well, this organic farmer he must be for you know uh, increased public education, uh, more government uh, agencies, uh, abortion. I mean, you name your name your whole kind of liberal litany of of uh, agenda items, and um, and I I realized, man, I'm. You know, I'm this conservative voice in a very greeny weeny tree hugging kind of uh, um, uh, situation, and so that's why I, I adopted, I created this moniker, Christian Libertarian Environmentalist Capital Lunatic Farmer, uh, to have fun with that and help people to understand. Be careful about putting me in a in a in a stereotype. I mean, I'm a libertarian who talks about, for example, uh, in fact, next week I'm traveling to uh, Orlando to to um, to speak at the National Libertarian uh, uh, Political Gathering in Orlando, and uh, and one of, and and one of my speeches is going to be, is that really your river? And I'm going to challenge the libertarians there um, to appreciate the word commons. Libertarians don't use the word commons very much. Now, now I'm also not a believer in government owning a bunch of national parks and wilderness areas either. Uh, okay. So, 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 uh, you know, as soon as I say the word commons, oh, he must be, you know, he must be for the Buffalo commons and get rid of all the ranchers. And, uh, no, uh, that's not the case. And so, so I I just find my, I appreciate, uh, John, you're pointing out this tension because there really is a tension, uh, between the, you know, the, the, um, the the proper use of our resources and the proper stewardship of our resources and that's that's a very uh, delicate balance and generally i find that when the government tries to come in as an arbiter of that tension rather than just awareness in the marketplace awareness in messaging that when the government comes in it's actually worse than it was before the government entered I think uh, your moniker, Christian Libertarian Environmentalist Capitalist, uh, kind of pretty much uh, encompasses what this show is about. 
<laughs> my, my question would be, how did you, I'm sure you've heard of um, Marvin Haymare, Haymare from uh, Granby, Colorado, who got fed up with uh, all this government intrusion in his life. And he just wanted to do his own business. But the city council came in, everybody came in, government officials, and just were unrelenting in their way of legislating and preventing him to work his, his own life. And he became what's known as the killdozer. And he constructed a, a machination of terror against the government and set out the next day and, and uh, wrecked his uh, vengeance. Um, how did you prevent your, how did you not go that route? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you didn't. I'm glad you rent the route of, let me educate everyone about the dangers of government <laughs> and writing books and tours and showing maybe there, this is the path we should take and not fall prey or uh, bend the knee as you will. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, I think that we all have individual skills and talents and, you know, my, uh, whatever my response or, or let's just say what I can do, what I can do will be different than what you can do. Uh, I mean, I think what you guys are doing with a, with a podcast is people say, you know, why don't you have a podcast, man? I, you know, uh, I don't have a clue how to do a podcast. And so I'd be a fool to do a podcast, but I know how to write. I know how to speak. So I come on as a guest to you know, good grief, sometimes, you know, half a dozen podcasts a week. And, uh, and, and I feel like, you know, I can reach way more people doing that than trying to do my own thing, frittering away. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hooking my wagon to other people's talent who enjoy, you know, podcasting and can work the technology and all that. And, um, and I, you know, I'm a book guy, so I can write and, and I can have a successful farm. And I think, I think that there's a lot of credibility in simply, um, in simply do doing your thing as a success that then draws people to you just by the power of, of truth, the power of success um, in, in an instructive way rather than a destructive way. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I co-own a small slaughterhouse, <clears throat> my wife and I up here in Harrisonburg, we have a partner there who happens to be a, a great liberal Democrat and and loves paperwork and filling out you know all those compliance forms bless his heart you know man i'm glad he's he's there and, and and he appreciates my entrepreneurial bent and and my you know kind of my uh oh just gut sense of where we need to invest what we need to do you know as business he said, i wish you were up here more i said if i was up here more i'd go postal uh because when i see how those inspectors uh, treat the bureaucracy treats us. Um, you know, I, I would go, I would go nuts. So I try to keep myself out, out of the situations where, you know, my frustration will boil over with the system. And I try to let it come out in my, in my pen, the pen sharper than the sword. And so, um, so there it is. Yeah. So, so I was going to say, I think that's a great way. Cause uh, you're mentioning the moment you start reaching an interesting market share, you get attacked. Um, you know, so what's the recourse? A lot of people will just take it. I think bringing attention to these problems, highlighting these dangers of the USDA of the agriculture is also happens to be a great buffer against further attacks uh, because they know then you have become the beehive, right? Uh, they know then, whereas it was kicking them becoming the hornets. Now you have become the hornet. Now you've brought a lot of attention and people can advocate on your behalf. People can know about the situation. And I think the louder we speak about these truths, the more that people can be aware and be safeguarded and be protected. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, in fact, um, I got, I got scuttlebutt back from uh, one of the inspectors up over here in the Shenandoah Valley uh, who came back kind of secondhand to me. And he said, he said, uh, oh, that poly face, they're, they're the junkyard dog. We just don't want to mess with them. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain, you know, people say, you say these things and don't, don't they come after you? No, they, they leave me alone. That, that's the, look, generally, these bureaucrats, they don't, they don't want to fight. They just want to go to work, check their boxes for the day, and go home to their kids. Yeah, really, they're not evil people. They're just, they're just you know, doing their thing. and. And, uh, and when you, when you, when you foist upon them some sort of, uh, whatever evil demonic, 
uh, a sinister thing, um, uh, that, that doesn't help any of the situation. Just assume that they're, you know, sincerely minded, good people trying to do their job. And th- this is where I even uh, break faith with many of my, you know, my organic friends uh, that, that I, I am unwilling, I'm unwilling to say that Monsanto is evil. I mean, Monsanto personifies the, you know, the great big bad, you know, uh, demon in, in, in organic circles. Okay. Um, just like, you know, in, in bad food, McDonald's is the, you know, every ism has its like its zenith of, you know, the, the, the most iconic representation of whatever this is. And, um, and so, so Monsanto, of course, is the ultimate, you know, bad guy in this. But I'm, I don't believe for a minute that the folks there are evil. I think they're sincerely minded. They really think they're, uh, if people like me proliferated, the world would starve. And thank goodness they're here to protect the world from me. And, I, and so, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, demonstrate against them. I don't throw manure at McDonald's. I, you know, I, I just, my message is, okay, do your thing, but leave me alone to do my thing. That's all I'm asking. And, and, but the problem is that those big outfits, they use their, their strength, their, their wine and cheese dinners with politicians and their lobbyists to actually um, subsidize and concessionize their their uh, special status legally and, 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 and actually use that status to marginalize uh, competition from smaller outfits like me. And that's unfair. Um, and that's what I fight against. I, I don't fight against their, their freedom to do what they want to do. And, but all I ask is, you leave me alone and I'll, I'll do what I want to do. Can't we just, um, can't we just, you know, uh, live together? But, you know, when, when they, when they think, when, when they actually think that my uh, chickens out, outdoors are going to rub beaks with a red winged blackbird and my chickens have to be sick because I don't medicate them or, or vaccinate them. So we know that wellness comes out of a bottle or a syringe. So if, 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 an an, if an animal doesn't have a pharmaceutical, it has to be sick. So the red winged blackbird is going to take my sickness to their Tyson chicken houses and they're going to, you know, lose their business and their farm. We're going to have, you know, high path avian influenza because I'm so negligent. I let my chickens be outside. You know, this, this is the kind of mentality that keeps you from being able to live as neighbors side by side with different viewpoints of the world. It's the um, crony capitalism, you know, it, it, yes. and we always yes. criticize it. And uh, as libertarians, you know, a lot of people will come to you. A lot of people on the left will come to you and say, well, you know, but what, why is it that uh, Monsanto can rub elbows with the big shots in government and then get special treatment? Well, it's like, well, that I don't see that as a free market. You know, I see that as uh, special, special privileges. You know, before the show I was reading about, um, one of the cases, the Supreme court cases that really, I always think about when it comes to farming because, and regulation and, uh, Wickard v. Phil burn, which is, uh, the, the basic gist is the farmer can't, the, the farmer can be regulated because anything he does exerts a substantial economic effect on interstate commerce. This is how they use the interstate commerce or the, the commerce clause. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, the, the government, it seems like they'll find any way to get to you. Um, it doesn't even have to be constitutional, you know? And so the, um, what I, that's what I try to, to explain or impress upon, uh, critics of capitalism or free markets is that this is not, well, you know, we're trying to establish free markets and, uh, people like you are doing, doing it, but it's, uh, it's not easy. Right. I like to call no. it socialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, in, in fact, I think it's important to realize that historically, I mean, this, this is a, my, my favorite case in point to, to, to this point, that in 1906, when Upton Sinclair, uh, who was a socialist, wrote The Jungle, um, he was actually not, he was, he was actually uh, trying to get, you know, workers taken care of, but his descriptions of, of people in Chicago meatpacking plants you know, falling into the meat grinders and, and people were, 
just, uh, uh, you know, uh, grossed out that, oh man, you mean that, that pound of ground beef I had last week might've had somebody's finger in it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, what it did, it, it dropped within six months of the jungle being printed. At that time, there were, I think, seven, seven large packers, Swift and Armor and, and others, uh, there, there were there were seven large packers that controlled about fifty percent or better of the American uh, market in beef. Within six months of Upton Sinclair's book being uh, printed, those uh, those big companies lost half of their market, half of their market, and and that market went to little small community butchers and and you know neighbors, and there was a revival. Uh, of of small scale you know processing and community uh, food commerce. Well, of course, the big companies they were going bankrupt, so they came to Teddy Roosevelt, who also was a socialist, and um, and asked him uh, for relief. They said, "People don't trust us anymore. We need we need a we need a government stamp that 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 that'll let people trust us again." And so, of course, he you know um, he did the food safety inspection service and intervened and gave them their blue, you know, inspection sticker. Um, and now here we are uh, a little over a century later, and what was considered at that time monopolistic seven outfits controlling uh, 50% of the nation's beef, today we have four outfits controlling over 80%, and that's not considered monopolistic, that's considered free market. How do we get, how do we get from, from seven of 50% being monopolistic to four at 80% being free market, well, it's called the FSIS. The government involvement uh, made it more and more difficult for small outfits to compete with the host of regulatory compliance licensing that they stacked on these small outfits. And so we lost this very decentralized, democratized, uh, um, you know, community oriented. Um, processing capacity as it was centralized and amalgamated within what we have today. What's interesting about the pandemic is, of course, that that has now revealed the fragility and the vulnerability of this large-scale mega processing uh, um, thing. And so for the first time, we're actually having a, you know, the emperor has no clothes moment, realizing, well, maybe Maybe some of these shuttered community small-scale abattoirs um, should be reopened, and may- maybe efficiency, maybe efficiency should should uh, take an equal position with resiliency. Maybe resiliency is Im- as as important as efficiency. Right. The um, especially uh, with Upton Sinclair, but the jungle. It turns out. Uh, the only thing investigation he ever did, he took a regular tour of a meat processing plant that was really given to anyone who was there. He never actually right. did the investigative work. He never did any of the detective work. All that stuff was actually, but it turns out when, uh, when it was revealed, he made up. <laughs> he made up just about everything else in that book. <laughs> None of it was. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not beginning to, uh, whatever, to authenticate what Upton Sinclair said. I was using it as an example of where, of where the market responded, whether the book was correct or not, the fact is that the market resp- responded to information. And, and, and markets always respond to information. And to think, that, to think that, that markets can't respond to information is to assume that the average citizen is, a, is an ignorant oaf, I- incapable of discernment and choice. And, uh, and so, so, so what I always ask people, yeah, I don't debate whether, you know, the jungle was true or not. What, what I debate with people is, what if, what if Teddy Roosevelt had said, no, you guys have made your bed, now lie in it, and uh, I'm not going to make a government agency that you can hide under, the, hide under the skirts of, you know, from now to eternity. Uh, you've got to get out of this yourself. Well, if that had happened, A, A, Perhaps none of those companies would have gotten uh, bigger anymore. Number two, some of them would have maybe gone bankrupt, and there would have been a, a, a resurgence of small decentralized facilities around the country that we might still be enjoying today. And number three, 
if people were scared, they would have started private, private inspection services like AAA, like Michelin rating, like um, uh, Underwriters Laboratory. I mean, there are, there are a host of these uh, independent private labeling kind of things uh, that, that people join and by proxy then uh, create protocols and say, you know, we put our stamp of approval on this outfit because they adhere to this, 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 and this. And, um, and, and that kind of private, uh, private auditing, private vetting would have been done in lieu of a government program. And, um, and today, we wouldn't have the level of regulatory, um, you know, regulatory uh, tyranny, and I call it uh, extortion, within the processing uh, industry that makes it very, very difficult for small businesses to, to compete because all the regulations are scale prejudicial. They're all easier to comply if you're big and hard to comply if you're small. And any regulation, any law that is scale prejudicial is, a, is by definition an unfair law. Well, then somebody says, well, well, give me an example of one that's not. So here's an example, speed limits. It doesn't take any more effort to put your foot on the brake of an 18 wheeler as a, as a, as a Prius. Um, it, it's the, it's the same thing. So speed limit is a, is an example of one that's not scale prejudicial depending on the size of your vehicle. And, and if that became the standard for regulatory, uh, you know, regulatory compliance, uh, it would fundamentally change, you know, most of the, most of the regulatory climate that we have. Right. Yeah. The, um, you know, I, I think back to, I grew up in the Northern, Northern Maryland, Frederick area of Maryland. And, uh, I had a friend who had a farm and he, uh, it was a milk a dairy farm and they had a big like uh, metal container of milk, I guess. And this was before it gets sent off to get pasteurized. And, uh, I could, he just like gave me a glass of it. I was like, whoa, 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 wait a sec. That hasn't been thoroughly processed and gotten all the stamps and the government approvals. I can't drink now. I, I just drank it and it tasted really good. And I was like, wow, this is okay. And he's like, yeah, I've been drinking it. And that was all like the, that was all the stamp of approval I really need for just him to be like, yeah, I've been drinking. I'm fine. So. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, the, the notion, the notion in our country that every business is out to try to, uh, uh, to kill their patrons is is a, a a silly notion on, on the face of it, but on the second part of it, realize that there are charlatan businesses. Of course, there are charlatan businesses and and cheaters and that sort of thing. Well, what you know, what keeps them from cheating? What keeps them from being charlatans? Well, one of the things that keeps them from being charlatans and cheaters is the responsibility they have for their own actions. Right now, if there's a food recall, let's say there's some pathogen. Uh, I mean, we all, we all, you know, from from the the rat urine and the peanuts in Georgia to you know whatever it is. Every time there's a recall, what's the first thing the CEO does? He calls a press conference. CEO goes in front of the cameras and he says, "We are complying with all the government appropriate government regulations." Da 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 da. da you know, and. And there's, there's no personal liability there. We did this. If, if there were no government skirts to hide behind, all the cheaters would have to come out and own their own charlatanism, their own fraudulence. And, 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 and that becomes a great uh, break, if you will, on, on, on uh, cheating, on, on personal uh, accountability. And the fact that right now the regulations eliminate personal accountability. I mean, I, I, in Richmond, in hearings I've gone to before when I've asked for, for you know, uh, um, the unregulated trade between, you know, between um, a neighbor and myself. In other words, I believe that if you want to come to my farm, like you did, uh, uh, John, with your glass of milk, and you want to look around, ask around, smell around, and as a consenting adult, exercise your freedom of choice. And I'm using powerful phrases here. Um, and, 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 and determine for your own microbiome the fuel for your own uh, cellular structure. That should be a choice you make and not some other bureaucrat making for you. And so 
So as soon as I head down that path, the politicians and the career bureaucrats, they say, but but aren't you scared of liability? I mean, I mean, you're going to, oh, oh, you know, that you're going to take all of that, that responsibility for your food on yourself. Yes. What? If I want to do that, why shouldn't I be able to exercise that level of responsibility and, and take that liability upon myself? Who, who suddenly made you king to tell me, no, you can't, you can't take that responsibility. Um, we, the, the government has to take that for you so that, you know, so that you're not liable for what you're producing. Um, and then of course, guess what? We get to tell you what can come to the marketplace and what kind of infrastructure it has to go through and how many thousands of dollars of stainless steel you need in order to bring that to market and, you know, blah, 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 blah. It goes on forever. Right. I think, um, when you're earlier, we're talking about, uh, the pandemic earlier, we're talking about, I guess, pretty much, uh, the coronavirus and such. Um, there's been this, um, interesting fear mongering. I hear mostly from the left where they say, like, we you know, um, the government is uh, closing up the borders. Mexico is closing up the borders. And then people will make these claims of saying like, um, you know, we're not going to have uh, people to tend our farms. We're not going to have people to harvest this stuff. And I think people easily kind of forget that uh, in American history, over 70% of the occupancy and workers were farmers. <laughs> it's not a thing. America has a great rich history of being farmers. It's not a difficult thing to bring that back or still continue to be. It's not like uh, the trade has disappeared. Uh, what do you say to um, when people think that, well, without uh, other people coming in and tending to our fields, we have no food? Yeah, well, what I say to that is that uh, if we eliminate welfare, we'll have all sorts of people wanting to go into those fields. Right. Um, the, 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 fact, the fact that we have uh, made it so easy to, um, to loaf through life in our country um, you know, we have, we have actually denied people were the, 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 the affirmation that comes with, uh, with sacred work with actually doing something. We have created a whole sector of, uh, of parasites in our, in our country, uh, that think they can go through life without having to work. And um, and I, I think that if we eliminated eliminated all all government welfare um, and and cast that back on philanthropic organizations and reduced all of our taxes commensurately, we would have thousands and thousands of our own people ready to go into the fields and harvest the food and and work. Right. Uh, you know, some people talk about taxation. You know, is um is, is taxation uh, the price to pay for a government safety and security in our food through the Food and Drug Administration? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and, and how and how safe or, or you know how safe has that made it? You know, um, it, it's hard for us right now to appreciate what is not available to the average to, to me to you to uh, you know, things that we would like to buy uh, or that we could buy were it not for these onerous uh, food regulations. And, and uh, um, I mean, think about, think about uh, homemade charcuterie, for example, homemade uh, uh, bologna. I mean, right now, right now we can go and um, we can go to the woods and shoot a deer and take that deer to a, to a neighbor's, uh, he's got a little, kind of a little meat meat processing thing. Uh, and he can, and he can turn that into summer sausage for us with no inspection whatsoever. So we, we can shoot a deer. Nobody looks at the carcass, even though it might have Kreisfeld Jakob's disease, which is the, the venison, the dairy, dairy equivalent of mad cow. Nobody looks at it. We take it to this guy. We pay him. He turns it into summer sausage, gives us these wonderful, nice, big, Things. I mean, this stuff is to die for. I could, I could live. I think I could live on it. Um, and but, but he can't. If we take a beef down there, he can't do beef because that's regulated. So he can only do wildlife because that's unregulated. We can eat it. 
We can give it to our friends. We can have a party and feed it to children even with no inspection, no bureaucrat from, from all the way from when the deer was shot, gutted, transported, drugged through the squirrel dung and the sticks and rocks and paraded through town on the front end of my blazer to show off my trophy. And again, none of this is inspected. We can feed, we can eat it, we can feed it to our kids, we can pay a neighbor to make summer sausage. But if we take one pound of beef, that's illegal because it's beef and not venison. And we can't sell a pound of it to anybody because it's a regulated product. And so this clearly is not about safety. It's not about safety. It's about what do you allow for market access? I can tell you right now, if we could, if we could sell the summer sausage to our customers, and you know, we've got we've got, you know, four or five thousand families that that buy from us, they would go crazy over the summer sausage. Sometimes when one comes in the door at the, at the farm, uh, you know, sales floor, I'll, I'll whack off, you know, maybe I'm having lunch, you know, and I have a, a piece of it and I whack off piece, hand it to him. Oh, oh, where can I buy this? Where can I buy this? Oh, sorry. You know, it's, it's, it's illegal to sell, but that same story from cheese to, to all sorts of things could be repeated over thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So the tragedy here is not that is, is, is partly entrepreneurs can't come to market with things, but the tragedy is the market does not have the choice that, that it would otherwise have. Local communities don't have the commerce they would otherwise have. Neighbors can't enjoy the kind of intimate uh, uh, economy that they would otherwise have. Th there are all of these threads that, that, um, that change when we have this level of, uh, of onerous um, um, you know, repression, repression on an otherwise vibrant, you know, entrepreneurial market choice. Yeah, the, um, this reminds me of the Prime Act uh, introduced yes. by Thomas Massey, the processing revival and intrastate, intrastate meat exemption act. And uh, it, yeah, I, I watched his documentary. Uh, it's called Off the Grid with Thomas Massey. It was really, uh, it, fascinating the way he lives. I, I, did you see that one? Yes. Well, Th Thomas and I are great friends. He's been here to the farm and, and we talk, we've done podcasts together. Uh, he's just a fan. Uh, I don't know how the guy gets elected. I mean, he's, he's the one bright <laughs> hope. Yeah. You know, I, I look at him, I say, how does a guy like this get elected? And I think part of it is he's just, he's so winsome. How can you not like Tom Massey? He's funny. <laughs> he's a uh, clever He's articulate, and here, here he's a perfect example. Uh, John, you were talking about the, the, the tension of the conservative and liberal. Here's a, here's a, uh, an extremely conservative guy. He lives off the grid. He raises his own food. I mean, who is the true environmentalist? Is is the true environmentalist? Uh, you know, a a liberal big governmenter uh, that that wants you know government what agencies, policies, and increased taxes and bureaucrats to, 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 do, to do all this environmental stuff for them, or is it a conservative do-it-yourself do or self-reliance person who has her own garden, cans their food, cooks at home, and, and, um, and, and, and you know, processes their own chickens and, and does their own stuff at home? I would suggest that the real environmentalist of those two is the person who's actually viscerally participating in the environment, not someone who's lobbying for a bureaucrat to make regulations to police everybody to take care of the environment. Right. Yeah. They, the green new deal. I can't imagine <laughs> the devastation. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's beyond the pale. <laughs> I think it highlights the differences between the builders and the people that want to do something and the do getters, the people that feel like, I have to force this upon you. Uh, how can we, I know that you've had experience in helping other people launch their businesses and also like getting good messages out there. How can we like, you know, when you get established to a point and the state is almost to the point where they don't want to mess with you because it's like kicking the beehive. How do we get more people to that escape trajectory? 
Oh, what a great question. Uh, you know, um, it's really a mindset. It's a mindset of not bowing. I mean, our culture, our culture, uh, from, from public school all the way through, you, you're, you're taught that whatever your dreams are, your dreams are subservient to the, the orthodoxy, <laughs> whatever the orthodoxy is. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in coloring right now, uh, the teacher says, no, you can't color now, you have to read. And so you have to get rid of coloring and start reading, right? And, and so we're, we're actually trained as a culture to, um, to, to cater, to kowtow, if you will, to, you know, experts, to officials, to the, to the bell, to the, you know, to the official orthodoxy. Um, and, and so it takes a pretty uh, independent-minded spirit to, to even question, uh, well, I look at, I look at uh, for example, right now, Dr. Anthony Fauci, okay, you know, the, the CDC uh, uh, guy, all right, I mean, he's the face of this whole thing, and I mean, like in the newspaper this morning, I think there's, I think there's three or four pictures of him, you know, he's before this uh, hearing here, he's a hearing here, he's, you know, all this, and, um, and I, I ask myself, this guy has been so wrong on every prediction. I mean, not a little bit, a, a, a lot. Okay. And I'm wondering how does this guy even get on a stage anymore? Who believes this guy at all? And yet, and yet if you walk down the street, he's like a God, everybody's following him. They follow him off a cliff. And so I think, I think your question, Kurt is, 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 is not is not really a, a a how to question. It's a mindset question. It's a how do we get people to to become dubious about the official narrative? Uh, you you all know. You all know. Take pick, pick your narrative. I, I don't care what it is. Pick your narrative, and ninety percent of the time, I don't want to say a hundred percent, but I'll just say ninety percent of the time. Whatever that official narrative is, whether it's whether it's World War II, Vietnam, Pearl Harbor, uh, the Tet Offensive, the Domino Communist Theory, the you know weapons of mass destruction, uh, you know, just just go through whatever the official narrative is. It's probably not true, and again, that's not conspiracy. That's not conspiracy. It's simply it's simply. Circling the wagons to protect the status quo. That's what it is. And, and, and all these people, they go to the same college. They've had the same professors. They play golf together. They, you know, they, 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 they've drunk the Kool-Aid. And so it's a mindset um, of, of, of awareness where you, you wake up one day and, and you realize, well, these, these officials miss it. They, they, they miss it a lot of the times. In fact, they miss it more than they, you know, uh, one, one of my pet hobbies is, is actually collecting prophecies. I've got them from way back, you know, in the 1800s. Um, and, and, and uh, for example, uh, you know, in the late 1800s, all the politicians were prophesying that, uh, that women would never want to vote. No, nah, women would never want to vote, you know. And, and of course, the women's suffrage took uh, In 1966, the, uh, the, pre the CEO of IBM predicted the the world market for computers was about five for five computers in 1966 you know and so I, I collect I got a whole list of these uh, collecting and what you re you know in the famous one in 1929 October 8th 1929 the head of the Dow Jones Industrial Average said the bear market is here um, the bull market is here to stay and uh, everything's rosy and it's going to be great the next day you know people were jumping out of their out of their office windows and, and so, um, and, and so the, the, the fact is, it, it, it's, it's not, you're not just a, a, a pessimist. Um, no, you're, you're actually exercising discernment and wisdom and common sense to realize that the official narrative, the official narrative is, is more likely than not incorrect. 
And so what that does is it drives you, it, it, it drives me at least, it drives me to seek the maverick. I, I'm looking for the Joan of Arc. I'm looking for the, for the maverick that, that dares to question because next century, you know, the Galileo, the Columbus, the world is round, you know, the, the, the Michel Beauchamp, the French contemporary of, um, of Louis Pasteur. Who, who developed the terrain theory as opposed to the germ theory. I mean, so you start seeking this, you know, the road less taken, the, the maverick, because history will bear you out. Generally, the maverick is the one that had the, the truth, had the right idea. And, and, and the, mass, the mass orthodoxy wasn't right. I mean, think about the first guy in England that, start, that started keeping, I forget the guy's name, but in England, he, he started keeping the records of the deaths, and he was the first one that started to question whether the whether the, the Black Death was um, was a, was a you know like a, a some sort of a um, a demon as opposed to oh it, it might be fleas um, and, and, and you know uh, those people they they all get laughed to scorn in their day, but history exonerates them. Right, I think. Good. Well, I think you nailed it. Like, uh, I'm a contractor and I've been running into this week. It's, uh, lately I call them, it's not to be demeaning towards them or anything, but the people that work in the office, I just call them office jockeys. And I just happen to be here on the ground. So I have a more, a broad range of what I can see compared to them. So I'll tell them stuff and they'll always tell me that I'm wrong or whatever. And then when it all comes down to the end of the day, I was right the whole time. And now I had to, I had to satisfy their way of doing things first, but then, yeah, it always comes down to me in the end, being the one that's doing the work. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Here's a prophecy that I like to collect. Uh, here's it's, uh, it's by Paul, Paul Krugman, who said that the uh, internet's effect on the world's economy would be no greater than the fax machines. And that was in 1998, you know, <laughs> how wrong was he? <laughs> <laughs> that was a New York Times article. <laughs> right. Um, on the front cover of your book, Everything I Want to Do Illegal, uh, is that you? Is that you, the farmer? <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's uh, obviously our, our, my, our daughter's uh, like, cartoon likeness of me. But yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> right. Uh, if, if you were appointed Secretary of Agriculture, uh, what are some changes you would do besides abolish the Department of Agriculture? <laughs> okay, so um, if, if there if there was one thing, sometimes you know you can get uh, too much choice, and then if you get too much choice, you got paralysis. So if, if I were King for a day and could do one thing, just one thing, I would actually add to the Bill of Rights uh, a, a, another amendment that would grant every citizen the right to the food of their choice from the source of their choice. I would call this the Food Emancipation Proclamation. Those are, again, I use powerful words, but the fact is right now our food system is shackled. It's shackled. It's enslaved by a labyrinth of regulatory tyranny that precludes choice and freedom in the marketplace. You are so right. We, what we have is not the product of free market. It's, it's, it's the product of anti-free market. We have not had a free market in food for 140 years. Arguably, we've not had a free market in food ever since Abraham Lincoln started the USDA. Um, that's why Abraham Lincoln is the worst president. Uh, he he gave us the USDA and decided let's get the government meddling in uh, in agriculture so we can tell farmers what to do. They're too stupid to figure it out themselves. And so, so you can just trace uh, where we've come as a result of that meddling. And so the the Food Emancipation Proclamation would would uh, suddenly open up the floodgates of of um, of competitive commerce at a local uh, scale, um, and, and th th this, this is not eliminating the Food Safety Inspection Service. You know, that, that can go on however it wants to go on if, if it goes on. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that 
the that you and I would have the right to procure the food of our choice from wherever we wanted to do it. See, right now, if I can't get, for example, right now, if I can't, if my customer can't buy uh, that summer sausage that I was describing, our, our federal courts have over and over made it very clear in writing that an American citizen has no inherent freedom of choice to choose their food. There is none. And so I can't sue the government. I can't sue for constitutional redress if, if there's no infraction. So this, this uh, Bill of Rights, in fact, in fact, you know, I would simply suggest that the founders of our country um, missed this one not because it was an oversight, but because they could not have conceived of a day when I couldn't walk over to my neighbor and buy a glass of milk from his his milk cow. That they couldn't have conceived of that day uh, because it wasn't a global you know system like it is today. Uh, anyway, um, if, if we had that, then then if 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 a government agent got between my food choice and my supplier. I could sue the government for constitutional overreach in denying me my right to 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 um, you know to acquire the food of my choice, and um, I, I think that that I can tell you I you know I speak to thousands of farmers all over the country every year, and the 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 the, the pent up the latent entrepreneurial desire to to um, <laughs> to make summer sausage, to make uh, quiche, to make pot pies and, and uh, you know, integrity hot pockets. Uh, the, the, the latent desire to do that within our communities is, is just, all, all, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. And if this, if this Food Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, we would see the the centralized processing the amalgamated the power of these big outfits we would see it collapse in a year it would absolutely collapse in a year i think um recently there's been a collapse maybe perhaps um <clears throat> with a lot of industries because of the coronavirus there's been an uptick of people gardening making their own bread uh being more sustainable in general uh, you find people are kind of interested in seeing that maybe they're still too reliant uh, on, the, on these kind of industries uh, instead of on, on themselves. Uh, what do you have to say to that? And maybe perhaps to people who want to start uh, taking practical steps towards being more aware of the foods they're eating and, and growing it themselves. Oh, I, I'm all I'm all for it. Uh, you know, there's there's no comparison to what you grow yourself, what you do yourself. Um, use your own kitchen. We've we've never been more gadgetized in our kitchens. I mean, we've got bread makers and instapots and hot and cold running water, timed bake. Uh, I mean, Grandma would have given her eye teeth to have the kind of techno glitzy infrastructure. Uh, that we have in our average kitchens today. We've never been more techno gadgetized in our kitchens and been more lost as to how to use them. The average American only spends 14 minutes a day in their kitchen. Um, uh, Seventy-five percent of Americans have no clue at four o'clock what's for dinner. In fact, the new moniker among millennials, we used to say, what's for dinner? Millennials now ask, well, what's dinner? And so we have, we have dramatically uh, moved away from this intimate connection with our, our our food umbilical, if you will. And so anything, whether it's gardening, getting in your kitchen, going out visiting a farm, um, anything that you can do to reconnect to that, um, that sustenance umbilical uh, will bring more authenticity into your life and it'll certainly bring more accountability within the greater food system. I think most people are allergic to accountability nowadays, or that's what it seems. <laughs> well, that's, that's one thing I like about uh, conservatism is that uh, you, you work for that, you know, the, that, that toil in there and the rewards to reap from that. And I think uh, 
government welfare versus uh, philanthropy. And you find the church has been like the greatest philanthropist uh, in, in this country, uh, robs them of the opportunity for enjoyment of that reward from, from that kind of work. Um, I, I think um, it's a lot to be learned, even from growing your own garden and growing your own food. Um, wrapping up here in the last uh, few minutes here, uh, how can people uh, support Polyface Farms? Where can they find uh, some of your products to purchase? Well, certainly, uh, I mean, jump on our website, polyfacefarms.com. Um, you know, the website has a lot of things on there, not only wh where you can buy, but you can come and visit. I see where I'm going to be um, speaking. You can get books, um, you know, swag, uh, all those sorts of things. But uh, but that that's our you know that's polyfacefarms.com is where you can go to that. We uh, we do make deliveries um, within you know four hours. We have about thirty drop points that we service monthly um, uh, around the state and just in the southern Maryland and around DC, out down to Richmond, down to Williamsburg. And, um, and we do, we do ship nationwide. So, uh, we're welcome to, you're welcome to jump on that. I will tell you that the, the, uh, pandemic, like all, you know, small uh, integrity branded farms like us, um, are, you know, are struggling for inventory right now. I mean, we were just wiped out, uh, when those supermarket shelves went bare, um, our, our inventory that we had stacked up, you know, going into the season was wiped out in about two weeks. I mean, it was, um, I, I, I joke with people, if, if we had known the pandemic was going to be this good a marketing strategy, we would have ordered up a pandemic three years ago. Uh, <laughs> why'd they wait till now, you know? <laughs> but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to come out of it now. You know, we're getting our inventory uh, back up a little bit. We're in the heart of our season. And so we're beginning to climb. But we, I mean, we've been rationing food for the last uh, two months just trying to spread it to as many people as possible. But uh, now that we're kind of over that hump, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're good to, we're good to go. And we encourage folks to, um, you know, to go to the website, Polyface Farms, uh, look for us. We've, um, I've just written a new book, uh, Poly, uh, Beyond Labels, Beyond Labels. It's a libertarians, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's perfect for libertarians, Beyond Labels, as you can imagine. And um, that's just out, what, a month ago, and it's doing very well. Wrote it with uh, Dr. Christina McCullough. We co-authored. She lives there in Richmond. And um, so anyway, yeah, there's a lot there on the website. Come to it and, um, and take your time browsing through it. Yeah, I've been to, uh, when I was at Lunatic Farms, I took an armful of everything you had in your uh, shop. <laughs> Best bacon <laughs> in Virginia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no question. No, I mean, this is this is the real deal. You know, everything is pastured, GMO free. We don't use vaccinations, antibiotics, chemicals, and we've been doing this for almost sixty years. So, uh, so we're we're pretty we're pretty clean as far as that. You know, with, withdrawal and that sort of thing is concerned. We we compost. We don't do chemical fertilizer. Uh, animals do the work. Yeah, you need. Um, we know there's two ways to get people to really uh, buy into this. One is to come and see it. The other is to eat it. And if you can, and uh, so those are the two ways you can really, you know, if you're not convinced, um, try it one time and uh, you'll, you'll take, you'll know the difference. Any last questions for you guys? All right. Uh, I just, thanks for your time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be uh, to have this conversation with you. Um, I look forward to uh, visiting your farm again uh, and bring a lot more of our compatriots out there. I think it's a great learning experience and it's a great way to kind of ferment. I mean, uh, the the heritage of Americans is rebellion, and you know, it, it is to grow your own food is rebellious. Uh, to yes. be sustainable is rebellious. Uh, yes. So thank you for what you're doing, and uh, for those listening, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns, not money. God bless.